Hello, I'm that James guy, and this is my 2020 Chevy Bolt. We're gonna go for a little drive here. I wanna talk to you about something they never ever talk about when, when you're buying EVs. All the EV advocates are talking about how they're so amazing and there's nothing wrong with them and you drive them like a normal car, but that's not quite true. Three things that we're gonna talk about is number one's easy, it's highway speeds and how that affects EV range. Number two, we're gonna talk about the heater, using the heater and how that affects range. And number three, three's the big one, elevation. So this is for those people who live in the mountains or you want to travel on the highway through mountains and through mountain passes and all that kind of thing. Oh, I love this car. I've had this car for two weeks and uh, it's probably, I'm gonna say this, it's probably my favorite car that I've ever owned. I know, I know. I've had BMWs, I've had all sorts of millions of different cars. I love this car, but there are a couple caveats. I travel highways a lot, a lot. So through mountains passes, through, you know, nor my normal route is from Asoyas, where I live, all the way to the coast. It's about 350, 375 kilometers and it's through mountain passes and so there's a few things that you got to know when you're traveling through mountain passes because the biggest difference here is i can't just grab a jerry can and fill up my car when i run out of fuel right that's the big difference here number one highway speeds so chevy bolt above a hundred and about 100 kilometers per hour, there's a ring around the speedometer, it's green. As soon as you start getting up to 102, 103, 105, it changes from green to orange, and eventually at like 110, it's yellow. So what I would say is, you're good, your estimated range like for this car is 420 kilometers, give or take. Above 100, I'd say, is when the range really starts taking a hit. So I cruise at 105. I don't want to give up too much. I set the cruise control for 105. It's not too bad. I probably lose, let's say 10% of the estimated range compared to just driving it around town. In town, I get about 12 and a half kilowatts per 100 kilometers. That's really efficient. Out on the highway doing 105, more like 17. So just that bit of difference just shows you the, the percentage there. If we can whip out the calculator here. So that's highway range. If you think you're gonna be doing 130 in a car like this and getting your 420 kilometers of range as advertised, not gonna happen, folks. Um, around town, it's gonna to be good, but on the highway at 130, it's gonna die a very quick death. Keep that in mind. Now, if, if your trip on the highway is only like 100 kilometers, right? Who cares, go 130, big deal, right? You're gonna make it, it's gonna be fine. But uh, if you're going any sort of distance where you're going to really stretch out those charges, can't do it. That's why I go 105. Number two is the heater. The heater makes a big difference. You can see here on the screen, you know, it's uh, 178 kilometers. I turn the heater on and look at it drop. Not great, right? That's a big dent. Generally drops about 30 kilometers no matter what. The thing about heater usage is it's a constant draw of power. So in town, it's gonna make a larger percentage of difference than if you're on the highway going at a higher speed. If you're planning on, hey, I got 420 kilometers and I'm gonna make my 380 kilometer or 400 kilometer journey with the heater on, not gonna happen, folks. Now the big inrush of energy used by the heater is you know, is heating a bunch of water up with an inductive heater, at least in this car, uses a lot of energy, but as that gets warmer and you use less and less heat, obviously it's not gonna use a constant four kilowatts of power like this car does. It's just when it's, when it's initially heating up the coolant, right? Cooling systems on electric cars, there's generally three coolant loops. You've got the battery pack, which uses its own inductive heater. If it's really, really cold out, you're gonna use some energy heating up that battery pack up to where it's happy. And if the battery pack needs to be cooled off, well, guess what? It shares the AC pump that the cabin uses, and it's gonna use that same coolant loop to cool that battery pack down. The second coolant loop is for your cabin, right? There's a giant, you could call it a kettle, that heats up a bunch of coolant, the same kind of coolant that you'd have in an internal combustion engine car. 
and it's gonna heat up the heater core in this car. And likewise, you've got an AC pump. It actually shares it with the battery pack cooling to cool the cabin down. Third coolant loop is for your power electronics, right? It's not very warm. It basically just keeps all your electronics like your motor controller and your battery charger and stuff like that happy. Okay, now for the third and final thing is elevation. Elevation makes a massive difference in an electric car. Your electric car range assumes you're gonna get some regenerative braking, right? So not even where the elevation increases take place because when you go up, you know, you're always gonna come down. So whatever you lose going up the mountain pass, you're gonna gain it coming down. However, if your mountain pass occurs early in your journey, you are good to go, right? Because you're gonna have, you're gonna go up the mountain pass, you're gonna come all the way back down, and then you are going to, you know, probably have some flat ground at the end to kind of, you know, ride out the rest of your range. However, if your mountain pass is towards the end of your not journey, but more your battery pack leg, I guess you could call it between charges. If your if your mountain pass happens near the end, you're not gonna you're not gonna make it. You're not gonna have enough to get up that pass. And so I you know I've done a bit of playing around, driven to the coast and back a couple times, and it's a very different journey each way. Okay, this is the route, and you can see here this is a very squiggly, squiggly drive. By the crow flies, it wouldn't be too big of a deal, would it? All the way up, or all the way down. As the crow flies, it's like maybe. 250 kilometers, but this route's 390 kilometers. So if we add the elevation in, you can see here what it looks like. From a Soyuz, 290 meters, right? As we go along, there's one small pass. And as we cruise along uh, from Coston and then all the way in, you can see here what it does, right? So pretty flat, slowly increasing all the way to Princeton. And then we really start climbing. So out of Princeton, start climbing, and we reach Sunday Summit. Right there, we dip down a few hundred meters and then we climb all the way back up past Manning Park, 1,339 meters at Allison Pass. And then we go way down, 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 down. It kind of flattens out and then we go down to Hope, which is pretty much at sea level. And then we've got sea level basically all the way in through Chilliwack, Mount Lehman, Langley. Kind of went up a bit near Mount Lehman, but Anyway, that's our route. So what happened was we got into Hope. I was going to do a quick charge and then looked and I had a lot of kilometers left. So I ended up, we're staying the night in Abbotsford right here at Mount Lehman. And I looked and I had 55 kilometers left to my final destination in Delta. Um, my range showed 66. So I decided to go for it. There's a fast charger kind of right here just in case. So I would watch the estimated range, compare it to Apple Maps and what I said I had left. And I made it just barely uh, at the end. When it gets down to one bar left, the car kind of freaks out a little bit and range anxiety was real, but I made it with 3% battery pack remaining. And if you look here, I used 61 kilowatt hours of the battery pack since last charged. And if you factor in that's 3% remaining, I have an actual usable pack of about 63 kilowatt hours. And so elevation is huge. You can see here, we start at 292. It makes all of the difference. So you can see here on the way in, I knew as soon as I made it past here, we were good to go. We had this long stretch of highway that we could, you know, ride the rest of our pack out on and deplete it by the end. So I knew I'd probably make it this way. No problem. So halfway going that way, uh, Manning Park is actually the halfway by kilometers point. So not an issue. Uh, net decrease in elevation, we were good to go. However, coming home, I didn't quite start in Delta. I actually started here in Surrey. So it was actually 360 kilometers, but that's kind of the point where it goes downhill from there. I didn't really know that till I did this exercise with elevations that this, I thought this Richter pass was higher, but I knew with this net elevation increase that probably wouldn't make it home with the same charge. So this was a 360 kilometer journey starting at 100% charge. And what I decided, cause I got scared in Princeton, I decided, you know what, let's just do a 10, 15 minute top up. I think it did 15 minutes that way. I know I'm going to get home. And then I looked at the gauge on the dash as far as kilowatt hours used since last full charge. 
And even if you do a little 15 minute top up mid journey, that doesn't reset. So what I did, what I did was I topped it up as we kind of continued on towards the end of the journey. When we got to the top here, I looked and it was at 59.4 kilowatt hours since fully charging the car. And I would have made it just barely, you know, but I didn't use any heater, didn't need to. That's another factor. My cruise was set for 105. Had I, you know, set it for 110, I probably wouldn't have made it. So there's so many factors that you got to think about when you're doing a trip like this. Uh, when doing trips like this, I started using Calc Maps. It's just a free thing. So what you can actually do is you can go around, for example, and hey, here's my hometown right there of Vesuvius. You can zoom in on it and I can click on it and you can see that it is 279 meters, right? Pretty easy. So as we kind of continue on, you can look at mountain passes, you can see exactly what's going on. And hey, the next journey I need to do, and thanks to this map, I'll be able to figure it out and see where I'll need to charge, is Creston. And here's the map to Creston. So you can see here, here we are in Asoyas, pretty squiggly line, there's a lot of mountains in the way, but here is the elevation map for Creston, so I used that uh, website and I figured this all out. Um, you can see here, Asoyas, first we have this massive climb over Anarchist Mountain. You know, along we go, no problem. Uh, there is a big mountain in here that we drive around. You can see there's a bit of a summit here, and then we descend down into Grand Forks, Christina Lake, and now we have Paulson Summit, which is a pretty big pull up to the top. Yeah, Junction 3B and then down into Castlegar. And there's a bunch of chargers in Castlegar. I don't know if it will make sense to charge in Castlegar. That's an easy one to do because we're basically the same elevation as we are here where I am now. But the problem is if we're above half battery pack, charging will be slow. So what you have to know is the fastest DC charging happens when you're from empty up till about halfway and it'll really start slowing down. So we got another mountain pass that I think will probably be easy to make all the way down into Selmo. So up and then back down into Selmo. There is one fast charger in Selmo and it is a flow charger with which tends to be fairly reliable, the flow chargers. Do I take the chance? Because as you can see here, I'm not gonna make it over this summit. This is a big one. It's close to the end, right? And so I don't think I'm gonna make it past that summit, I would make it up to about here and be stuck. So rest of the journey into Creston is what it looks like. No problem. So I think that's where I'm going to have to charge. Hopefully the flow charger there is a good one. Hopefully it works or I might be stuck. I might have to drive back to Castlegar and charge up. Who knows? As a little side bonus, here is a zero to 60 pull with the old Chevy Bolt. So with this all being said, I really, really like my Chevy Bolt. It does take in a bit of adjusting and a little bit of pre-planning before you go on a trip on the highway through mountain passes, that's for sure. But the car is an absolute pleasure to drive. I love it. And that's all I have for today. I hope you found this useful or at least mildly entertaining. I will see you next time.